Hello, and welcome back to this special episode of Please Don't Make a Scene. It's part two of the Resident Evil Chronicles. And as you remember last time, I was talking a bit about the first time I discovered that there was a Resident Evil movie, and how me and my friends were like pining over this movie for like a year before one of my friends magically made it appear on his computer. <clears throat> and he'd only watched it himself, selfish, <laughs> and he was now going to show it to me. And I was about to watch the movie I had been uh, just longing for, for, for so long now. So the time had finally come. And I was about to see the movie I'd been waiting for for over a year. So my friend and I, we started watching the first minutes, uh, first 15 minutes. And I was in heaven. It was everything that I wanted from a movie. It had suspense, mystery, elevator decapitations, military commando guys, and a naked lady. This was the best movie I had ever seen. And I was just, you know, yeah, I was walking on clouds. But then my friend, he just paused the movie. Just as they were gonna board the train, you know, to take them down to the hive. And I, I was like, no, what are you doing? Keep, keep playing the movie. And he said, no, I'm just going to skip the boring parts. And he proceeds to fast forward through the next 40 minutes. Just fast forwarding through the entire movie. Um, and you know, I, I can see glimpses of this just flashing by. A zombie there, some fire there. Uh, uh, is that a monster? What's going on in there? And I was like, and I, was, I was powerless to stop him. So then, then he stops and there's maybe 20 minutes left of the movie. And... We watched the last 20 minutes, and, and that was it, you know? Thinking about it now, why didn't I just make him rewind it? Well, I guess I was in shock, I'm not sure. So now, uh, the movie is over, and I have seen about a third of it, and my desire to see the entire thing was now even greater. But it was not to be. My friend deleted the movie shortly after from his computer, so we couldn't watch it again. Uh, and my parents would not buy it uh, for me you know, on, on VHS because of the age restriction. It was too expensive. And I couldn't afford it myself. I didn't have that kind of money. So, yeah. Life moved on. I soon forgot about the movie or at least, you know, compartmentalized it. A year went by. Things changed. I got my first DVD player. And I met my uh, future best friend. We met in school, this was yeah, elementary school, I was in 6th grade, I think, 6th or 7th grade, and we quickly bonded over movies. Turned out he was, uh, well, a big movie buff, just like I was back then. Um, <laughs> and, yeah, at this time, I had about four DVDs, I think. Um, I had this crappy edition of uh, A Fistful of Dollars, and this is actually the cover of that uh, DVD. Um, that me and my dad had bought together in a supermarket. That was, yeah, that, uh, talking about bonding, that was a real bonding moment. And the other DVDs I had was the, the Back to the Future trilogy box. You know, the first collector's edition. My new friend, however, he had like 10 or 15 movies on DVD. And it's a funny story, actually. The one movie we kind of, um, found a m mutual interest in was Cruel Intentions which I had seen on TV and he had on DVD. Yeah, I wonder what two 12-year-old boys found so interesting about that movie. Eyes closed. Anyway, um, yeah, we quickly became friends and we started this kind of friendly competition where we would uh, compete who could uh, buy 50 DVDs the fastest, you know. Not just buying them in bulk, buying any, you know, crap movie for a dollar or, well, ten crowns that would be. Uh, but actually buying movies we liked and, uh, you know, wanted to have in our collection. So now I was constantly on the prowl. I would use up any money I got, my, my weekend allowance or whatever. 
Um, and I would just use the money to buy movies. I was constantly looking for like sales of DVDs and stuff. Because this was in like 2004 or 2003. And um, yeah, DVDs were not cheap. So whenever you could get a, get a hold of a good movie at a, at, a, at a cheap price, you bought it. So there was this, there was one day I was leaving through a, um, a magazine where they were doing, they, they had a sale. They were cutting prices in like half at the store on, on books and board games and movies. So I leaf over to the, uh, the, to the DVD section and I look at, is there anything interesting, anything, anything? So I, no, not really, except for this one movie called Resident Evil. And it just like that just popped into my head again. I now had a chance to buy Resident Evil on DVD and watch the entire thing. But let's stop the story right there, just for a moment, and talk about Resident Evil Apocalypse, the sequel no one asked for. From the leading name in biotechnology comes Regenerate, the breakthrough from the Umbrella Corporation. Umbrella. 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 Resident Evil Apocalypse starts off where Resident Evil ended. The uh, virus has spread from the underground lab to the city above. Raccoon City. Alice, after waking up with tubes and needles stuck in her head, uh, quickly realizes that she has been experimented on. She now has superhuman strength, heightened senses, and for some reason she knows everything that Umbrella up is up to. Together with an eclectic group of survivors, uh, two cops, a news reporter, a, a pimp, and a commando type dude, Alice must find the daughter of the man who helped create the T-Virus, all the while trying to outrun Umbrella's latest biological weapon, the Nemesis. felt like the kind of sequel um, where the studio had just stepped in to try to fix the problems of the first one, or the original. Um, you know, they had removed Paul W.S. Anderson as director, uh, but he, he still had to write it, and he was managed to retain his uh, status as producer, which I guess was good. But, you know, so there were a lot of changes behind the scenes. Uh, so this movie, uh, it's just very straightforward. That's the first ch big change they did. Nothing is murky anymore. Nothing is kept in the dark. The audience knows everything. Uh, they're informed of everything Umbrella is doing at all times. They're no longer a faceless corporation that operates in like the gray area between good and evil. No. They are the most obvious bad guys here. And the protagonists are no longer these like bland, interchangeable, expendable military commando guys. Now every character is this very distinct archetype. I mean, you have the straight guy, the badass, the witty one, the obvious cannon fodder, and the, the innocent one. And Alice is there as some kind of big exposition machine slash deus ex machina. Everything is so transparent and, 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 and spelled out for you. Just laid out right there on the table. Nothing is complicated or convoluted. Nothing is... um. Is layered with some kind of depth. No, this movie is dumb. And that is the way to describe it. It's the best way to describe it. It's dumb. It's simple plot, simple characters, and a lot of mindless action that never forces you to uh, turn your brain on. I'm not saying that the original was some kind of cerebral masterpiece, um, but at least there was some nuance to a few of the characters at least. Um, and some of the plot you kind of had to figure out for yourself as the movie was going along. In Apocalypse, though, we're giving all the information we need about, you know, everything that's going to happen in the movie in, like, the first 20 minutes. And then you're just on standby until the credits roll. So, is there anything left to enjoy in this mess of a movie? Well, yeah, some of the action scenes are actually quite entertaining. Because the budget was bigger this time around. I mean, still not as big as, like, movies today or anything. It, it would still be considered, like, a moderately or even low-budget movie. 
because it was done at one of those movies that the studio knew it could pull in money, but they wouldn't really bank on it. So they just gave it a, a, a mid-tier um, budget. So the movie looks kind of cheap. Um, I mean, back in 2004 it was passable, but it has not aged well. Um, and also the director, Alexander Witt, had never really directed anything before. He was mainly a second unit director and assistant director for a lot of movies. So his style is very... Um, functional which meant that he would he would uh he would shoot and capture the action pretty well but whenever a scene involved any kind of emotion or or just people talking to each other it feels very forced and very stilted so all of this might sound like i enjoy uh the original more over apocalypse and to some degrees that's correct the original is, of course, the one that initially sparked my interest in this franchise. Um, but on a purely objective level, Apocalypse is more enjoyable. Because remember how I talked in the last video about how uh, Resident Evil, the first one, was so painfully average that it was never, like, actually good and never bad enough so you could laugh at it? Well, Apocalypse works better in that aspect. From the moment Alice literally rides into the movie on this Harley Davidson motorbike um, and just backflips off it. it becomes instantly hilarious. It still drags a lot of the time, but we're constantly served these ridiculous action scenes throughout the rest of the movie. It even manages to surpass the dog kicking scene from uh, the last one. Because um, there's this scene, at, at one point in, in, in the movie, um, Alice is standing on the roof of the skyscraper, and they're right out of, of the city. Um, this is helicopter which is parked um, all the way down on, on the ground floor of this building, well, outside. And it's surrounded by a bunch of, you know, bad guy commando type people. So Alice, you know, she does the only thing that you really could do in that situation. And she... <laughs> no, wait, you know what? Um, let me show you. Just let me show you this scene. So here we are once again, uh, we have arrived at the end of the movie and we're once again dealing with a film that doesn't really offer up any, uh, any amount of quality work. Except for one thing maybe, um, the nemesis guy.
looks uh, surprisingly uh, you know, like the uh, his his video game counterpart, you know, and the makeup and the effects, his whole costume thing, I think uh, looked really good back then and still works today. So yeah, if anyone should you know get some uh, kudos or some applause here, it's the effects team, um, or at least for that scene. Other than that, you know, that you know, no, that's about it. They had a moderate success with the first one, um, so they wanted to make a quick cash grab sequel, and um, nobody expected it to do as well. They just wanted to make some quick money. The thing is, it did very well for the kind of movie that it was. People just ate it up, hook, line, and sinker. Even I did. Me and my new best friend were, were at that movie, watching it day one in the cinema. So yeah. You're going to have to join me the next time where we talk about Resident Evil Extinction. And we talk about the first time I actually got to see um, Resident Evil, the entire movie. But yeah, um, that's it for this time. Uh, as always, thanks for watching. Uh, be sure to press like if you like this video and subscribe if you want more. Um, and also, if you want to sneak a peek at my Patreon, you, you go do that. But other than that, um, yeah, have a good one.